Easter. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Good morning and happy Easter. It's great to be able to welcome you to our Easter service today at Abbeywood Community Church. And we pray that you will be blessed as you spend this time with us, worshipping God and considering the awesome fact that Jesus rose from the dead. I wonder, have you found anything? Have you been looking around this morning? Was there anything secret and hidden? Did you find something special? Maybe something chocolate, maybe a bunny, maybe an egg. Oh, tasty. You can enjoy it, can't you? But our prayer is that we will enjoy more than chocolate today. Yes, eggs are a symbol of new life, aren't they? But Jesus rose from the dead. And what an awesome thing this is that we celebrate today. We're going to start by singing our first song, Great Things. Yeah, great things. God has done great things. And then Kirsten's going to be leading us in prayer. And then, boys and girls, you'll need to be ready because Sarah's going to be straight there with a story about Abraham. Or is it Abraham? Well, we'll find out and we'll learn more about him shortly.
every captive and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awaken alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great Heavenly Father, it's great to celebrate today that Jesus is alive. We want to thank you so much that death is defeated, that forgiveness and restored relationship with you is guaranteed. Thank you for the joy and the peace and the love that we experience as we journey through life with you. Father, we want to pray for those who don't know you yet, for our family and our friends and our neighbours in Abbey Wood. Please, in your mercy, would you this Easter Sunday help them to see who Jesus really is, that they would meet the risen Saviour for themselves. We pray for the government, that they would lead us well, and in the complex situations, Father, please would you give them wisdom. We pray for courage to do what is right, and for servant hearts. And we pray for ourselves that we will live for your glory and honour. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, boys and girls. Happy Easter. I love this time of year and I love that Easter falls at this time of year because when I look around, I see so many new things. Things like these beautiful flowers that are popping up out of the ground. Some of them aren't even opened yet, but they're new. It's like new life coming and I just think that's so neat. Do you ever wonder why we decorate Easter eggs? What do you think of when you see an egg? When I think of an egg, I think of what is growing inside of it. Some eggs we don't use for eating. Actually, there is a new life growing inside the egg and we'll get cute little chicks soon that'll hatch out of it. Maybe that's why we decorate Easter eggs because it's something new. It's like the sign of spring. That something new is happening. It's not all about just eating our weight in chocolate bunnies. It's about something different. And this week, our Bible, our Bible story, we're still talking about Abraham. And do you remember last week, God made a promise to Abraham. He made a covenant to him. And his covenant was that he would give him so many descendants and such a big family that the whole world would be blessed through his family. So we know that God promised to give Abraham a family, even though he and his wife were old and he didn't have any kids yet. But we know that God keeps his promises, and he kept his promise, and he gave Abraham a son, and he named him Isaac. But in today's Bible story, we're going to learn when God tested Abraham. And it might be hard to listen to and hard to understand, but what we need to remember is, even when we don't understand what God is doing, he can still be trusted. And just like Abraham, we can trust God. So let's listen to the story. God kept his promise to give Abraham a son. Abraham and his wife were very old when their son Isaac was born. One day, God tested Abraham. God wanted to make sure that Abraham loved God most of all. Abraham, God said, here I am, Abraham answered. Take your son Isaac to the mountain and give him to me as a sacrifice, God said. 
A sacrifice is anything of value brought to God as a way to show obedience, love, thanksgiving, or the need for forgiveness. During Old Testament times, a sacrifice usually involves killing an animal. This time, God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac instead. Abraham obeyed God. He got up early the next day and left with Isaac, two servants, and a donkey carrying supplies. They walked for three days before they got to the mountain where God wanted Abraham to make the sacrifice. Abraham asked his servants to stay with the donkey. And he and Isaac went up the mountain with the supplies for the sacrifice. Isaac noticed something was missing. My father, he said, where is the lamb for the offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb. When they got to the place God had directed them, Abraham built an altar and placed the wood on top. Then he put Isaac on top of the wood. Just as Abraham was about to sacrifice Isaac, the angel of the Lord called out, Abraham, Abraham. Abraham stopped. The angel of the Lord said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your only son from me. Abraham looked up and saw a ram trapped by its horns in the bushes. He offered to God the ram instead of Isaac. Abraham named the place, the Lord will provide. The angel of the Lord reminded Abraham that God would keep the covenant he made with Abraham. God again promised to bless Abraham, to make his family as numerous as all the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashores. God had promised victory over Abraham's enemies and blessing to all the earth through Abraham's family. Abraham showed his love for God by being willing to sacrifice his son Isaac. This is how God showed his love for us. He sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross so that we could have eternal life through him. So Abraham and Isaac went to the mountain where God wanted Abraham to make the sacrifice. And Isaac carried the supplies for his father, but he noticed that something was missing. The sacrifice usually involved killing an animal. But where was the lamb for the sacrifice? Abraham said, God will provide. And then putting his son on the altar was probably very hard for Abraham to do. But Abraham trusted God even when he didn't understand God's plan. And God made a promise to Abraham. Do you remember? What did God, what did God promise? God made a covenant to bless his people. God promised that Abraham would have a large family, but how could that happen if God took his son? God saw that Abraham trusted him, and the angel told Abraham not to hurt Isaac. God provided a ram to sacrifice instead. Let's look at these two verses. Genesis 22:12 says, Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Now that reminds me of a verse in the New Testament. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Abraham showed his love for God by being willing to sacrifice his son Isaac. And this is how God showed his love for us. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross so that we could have eternal life through him. What did God promise? God made a covenant to bless his people. And God said that through Abraham's family, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. God blesses all of the nations of the earth through his son, Jesus, who was born into Abraham's family many, many years later. Trusting God through these hard times can be really difficult. But even when God asked Abraham to give up his son, Isaac, Abraham trusted God. And that's what our key passage is about. Let's read it together. It's Romans 4, 3. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited 
to him as righteousness. Righteousness. Someone is righteous if he never sins like Jesus. So how could Abraham be righteous? We know that he sinned. Well, a person is also righteous if God takes away his sin and trades it for Jesus' righteousness. Abraham did not know that God was going to send his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sin, but he trusted that God would keep his promise to bless the whole world through him. Abraham did not know how God would do it, but because he had faith, God counted his sin as righteousness. And when we trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior, he takes away our sin and gives us his righteousness. And that is what Easter is all about. It's about God doing something new through his son, Jesus, who died on the cross and then rose again so that we could have new life. Just like we talked about the new life in the flowers and the new life in the baby chicks when they hatch. God gives us new life through his son, Jesus. I hope you guys have a great Easter. Enjoy this time together. But remember the great thing that God did through his son, Jesus. Sometimes things puzzle us, don't they? Uh, we don't see things quite as the same way that other people see things. And I'm sure that was true in the story that Sarah's just been telling us. Yeah, things don't seem to be quite the right way round. Sometimes when you're writing, it's a bit of a struggle, isn't it, to get things the right way round. Yeah, those Z's sometimes can just be confusing or, or the number five and it, it just doesn't seem to go right. Every time you write it, it seems to be the wrong way round. We've got a little video now. It's called The Wrong Way Round. Listen in and, and see if you can work out what is the wrong way round and why things are actually perhaps not all that they seem. So here's the video of The Wrong Way Round, and then we're going to be singing a couple of songs to worship God and to glorify him. The day Jesus died, everything was the wrong way round. The day Jesus died, it was dark in the middle of a bright day. Everything was the wrong way round. A friend is someone who sticks by when things are hard, as well as the times you're having fun. Well, the day Jesus died, his friends betrayed him, disowned him, ran away and let him down. Everything was the wrong way round. A judge's job is to let innocent people go free. Well, the day Jesus died, the judges listened to lies, ignored the truth, and sentenced Jesus to death. Everything was the wrong way round. A soldier's job is to protect people who do good. The day Jesus died, soldiers arrested Jesus, hit him, made fun of him, took all his belongings and nailed him to the cross. Everything was the wrong way round. A cross was made to take someone's life. But the day Jesus died, it didn't take his life. Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Then he gave up his spirit. The judges, soldiers and cross didn't take Jesus' life. He gave himself. Everything was the wrong way round. That's what makes the day Jesus died good. God made everything the wrong way round on one day to put everything the right way round in eternity. Jesus took our place, dying the death our lack of love deserved, so that everyone who trusts him can take his place, living forever his perfect love earned. Jesus gave his life to fix the broken world. Jesus gave his life to save imperfect people. 
Jesus committed his spirit into the Father's hands so that we can be safe with God forever. The day Jesus died, everything was the wrong way round. To put everything the right way for eternity. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could Such boundless grace The God of ages Stepped down from glory To wear my sin And bear my shame The cross has spoken I am forgiven The King of kings calls me His own Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise, your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the side.
pride is found in knowing that you wear the victor's crown. You're my help and my defender. You're my savior and my friend. By your grace I live and breathe to worship you. At the mention of your greatness, in your name I will bow down. In your presence fear is silent, for you wear the victor's crown. Let your glory fill this temple, let your power overflow. By your grace I live and breathe to worship. In a few moments, Danny and Siami are going to be reading to us from the book of Isaiah. It's in the Old Testament part of the Bible and it's chapter 53. It's a puzzling passage, this chapter, because it starts by saying, well, who's believed it? Who's going to believe it? This is so strange. Nobody will believe it. And it then talks about somebody who comes, somebody who's a bit like a plant that's coming up out of dry ground. How could that happen? And what good could it do? But that's exactly what this passage in the Bible speaks about. So listen in 
or follow it on your Bible app or in your Bible as Danny and Siami read from Isaiah 53. When they finished, we're going to be singing again and then Chris is going to be explaining something of Isaiah 53 to us. Yeah, not something of a mystery, but something planned all along. Let's listen in then. Sing and listen in some more. Isaiah 53, 1-6 Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53, verses 7 to 12. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer, and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the Lord, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life, and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Oh, 
After the Sabbath, some of Jesus' friends, some women who knew and followed Jesus, went to the tomb. And uh, a little later on, so did some of his disciples, Peter and John. What were they going to do? What they were going to discover when they went to that tomb? He's not here. He's risen. He's alive. I mean, yeah, he was dead. He was dead. He was definitely dead. I mean, the way they beat him, the way they crucified him, putting nails in his hands and his feet. I mean, such a beating, such bruising, such blood. Yeah, of course he was dead. And in fact, they pierced his side and blood and water flowed from it. So medically speaking, that confirmed he was definitely dead. No doubt about it. Dead. And that's why he came. He came to die. But now, he's alive. Because he also came to rise again. To defeat death. To overcome it completely. His death was for us. In our place. And his resurrection is also for us. So that we can too live forever. Knowing that death is dead. Yes, Jesus was dead, but now he's alive. The only thing that's dead is death itself. And when I say that, obviously I recognise that humanly speaking, we're going to die physically. We're all going to die physically, unless of course we're still around when Jesus comes again, and then we won't, but as it stands, we're going to die physically. Because of what Jesus has done, because of his death and resurrection, and if we believe in him and trust in him, that his death was in our place and his resurrection was on our behalf for us, we can live forever with God in, all, in, a, in heaven for all eternity. Death is dead in that respect. Spiritually speaking, we don't have to be separated from God forever. On Good Friday last year I shared this, but I'm going to share it again. In Psalm 23 it says that there is the valley of the shadow of death. And this is something we have to pass through. But for the person trusting in Jesus, the person trusting in the Good Shepherd, trusting their life and their death into his hands, it's just a shadow. So I gave the example, I'll give it again. 
you know, if there's some ferocious dog on a lead, on a chain, that couldn't possibly reach you, but you saw its shadow, you might be a little bit scared. But if you know it's not going to reach you, it's not going to touch you, it can't harm you, you realise it's just a shadow? It's just a shadow. What harm can a shadow do? And that's what Psalm 23 is saying, and that's what the New Testament confirms, that for the person trusting in Jesus, who believes in Jesus, that his death was in their place, that his resurrection was on their behalf, death is just a shadow. It's something, yes, we have to pass through or go, go through but it will lead us straight to the presence of God, the glorious and eternal heaven that he has prepared and is preparing for those who love him. The story we heard earlier of Abraham and Isaac, pretty mad story really. I mean, fancy that asking Abraham to sacrifice his own son. But in the end, he, he didn't have to, did he? And Abraham believed that God had some kind of plan Either he was going to provide a sacrifice, something to be sacrificed in the place of his son, or he even believed, it tells us in the New Testament, that Abraham believed in the resurrection, that he can raise him from the dead. God had a plan. God knew what he was doing and he knew that God was good. And so he proceeded with taking Isaac to the altar. And then God provided a ram caught in those bushes. And he was able to sacrifice that ram in the place of Isaac. And not only in the place of Isaac, but in the place of Abraham, because God had established very early on that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. There is no way to be right with God. And so by killing a lamb or a ram, or even since the time of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, that sacrifice was a way of showing to God that we were sorry for, or people were sorry for their sin. And that they recognised they needed a scapegoat. They needed someone else to take their place and bring about their forgiveness. Well, that lamb that was then sacrificed and put to death in the place of Isaac was a picture of Jesus Christ who would one day come and go up the mount of crucifixion and die on a tree, a wooden cross made for humans, but taken by the man who was also God, who was able, the only one who lived the perfect life, the only one good enough to die in our place. And because he was not just a man, but God, his sacrifice wasn't just enough for Isaac or Abraham or one person, but was of infinite value for all of us if we put our trust in him. And when I say Anybody, I mean everybody and anybody. I mean all kinds of people, rebellious people, religious people, anybody who is willing to repent. That means recognize that we are sinners, that we are guilty, and look at Jesus and see him on the cross and see him that as the one who took our shame and took our pain and took our sin. And he did that to as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, to be there in our place, to die for us so that we could have our sins forgiven, knowing that he would rise again so that we could live forever with him, so that we could share in the victory that not only makes him alive again, but that makes us alive again too. Every Pharisee, you came for hypocrites, even one like me. You carry sin and shame, the guilt of every man, the weight of all I've done, nailed into your hand.
tasted it It's running through my veins I can't escape its grip In you my soul is safe You cover everything Oh, you're Isaiah 53 was written hundreds of years before Jesus and yet it was so accurate in its predictions and prophecies regarding what would happen to Jesus, how he would suffer, how he was crushed and beaten, how he was pierced for our sins, how he took upon himself the sins of us all, our transgressions as Isaiah 53 says, just meaning sins, the things that we've done wrong. He prophesied that because that was always part of God's plan. From the time of Cain and Abel and the establishing of the need for a sacrifice to the picture we had of Abraham and Isaac, throughout the Old Testament there are pictures and promises and prophecies regarding what Jesus would do. That there would be this Saviour who would come, a man who was God, who would die in our place, who would be like a Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Isaiah's prophecy is one of the most clear regarding what would happen. But it doesn't end just with the cross. It finishes with the promise of life, the promise of resurrection, the promise of victory. As we said earlier, death is defeated. Death is dead because of what Jesus has done. He's now victorious over death, over sin, and over Satan too. And because he lives, we can live. We can have the victory as well. We don't have to pay the punishment necessary for our sin, which is death. But we can live forever with him because of what he's done. He's the victor. He's the king. He's mighty to save. And he can save each and every one of us. Save us to heaven. Save us to be with God in that glorious place forever one day. Because Jesus lives we too can live with him forever. As the message version of the Bible says, this is what God had in mind all along. Yes, to, to crush him with pain. And the plan was that he would give himself as an offering for sin so that life would come through him 
life, life, and more life, our lives, we would get life because of his life. And God's plan will deeply prosper through him. Let's praise him and recognize he is mighty to save. He's overcome the grave. Isn't it fantastic to think that God had a plan right from the beginning? Nothing took him by surprise, but he poured out his love to us in Jesus. How great it is to know that Jesus is mighty to save, that he has conquered death, that he has risen triumphantly and is now with God in glory, seated at his right hand. We're going to be celebrating that on Wednesday in our Together Growth Group. We'll meet together this week on Wednesday evening at eight o'clock. We'll be sharing a time around God's word. We'll also be sharing a time of communion. If you're not normally connected with the group and you'd like to be, if you'd like to be included, then please contact us at info at abbeywoodcc.org and we'll be more than happy to get in touch with you and to give you the details as to how you can join with us. And you won't be expected to do anything special or different. You can just be there and just link in 
and listen in uh, and that will be brilliant we'd be pleased to have you so that's eight o'clock on Wednesday and that's our growth group together this week we just thank God for his goodness to us and let's before we go pray together Father God we thank you for the awesome gift of Jesus Christ the sacrifice for our sin thank you that as he died on the cross he took the penalty that we should receive so that we might be free from the curse of sin from your punishment and we thank you that you have proved that you have defeated death and we can have a hope forever because Jesus rose from the grave we say hallelujah what a saviour thank you thank you for all you have done for us through Jesus amen may you have a really blessed week enjoy the brief holiday that we've got and enjoy meeting together with one another now that we can do that may God bless you